and the whole class is great to get together. And um, we're going to start with a song and then we're going to get into some great words and sharing and uh, just some great stuff. So uh, I'm just going to open up some prayers. Is that okay? Yeah, let's pray together. Father, thank you for a beautiful morning. Thank you for uh, bringing us together and uh, for your goodness and faithfulness throughout our lives. And may we just take a moment to uh, enjoy that pause and enjoy the gift of relationships that you've given us. And uh, I pray that we enjoy this time together. So we invite you to come and lead us, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see what you're doing and saying with us. And um, thank you that you're faithful and really good at doing that. And so. Uh, in light of that, we just want to press in and hear uh, and re remind one another of your goodness and your faithfulness. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hey, um, we've got some uh, some of my favorite hymns here, but um, there's a lot more, but I chose just a few. We're going to start with um, Holy, 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 right? Does everyone have music? Does anyone need music? Or just sing out loud like you know it. No. <laughs> us tomorrow. Good morning. Happy Sunday to you. Um, we are so blessed to have our teachers here um, to spend April, May, and June with us outside in the lawn. And um, thank you very, very much, Susan and Bob. And certainly, God is with us this morning in our outside church. Um, let us rejoice in his name. And there is beauty in the world. I received a beautiful little tiny flower that Esther picked up on the lawn to remind us of the beauty of God. Bill. 
Would you like to do the devotion? Yes. One other thing. Let's keep Nancy in our prayers. I understand that Nancy is back in the hospital, uh, but expected to be released soon. And also, let's continue to keep Wendy in our prayers. And Esther's brother. Pardon? And Esther's brother. Oh, and Esther's brother. Yes. Uh, and who is under the care of hospice. Good morning. Good morning. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O oh God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. Your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the highest of heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O oh God? You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore to me to life again. And lift me up from the depths of this earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. This is Psalm 71, 18 through 21. Whether our days on earth are few or many, God never abandons us. The writer of this song had lived a long life. In his old age, he felt abandoned by his friends and family. Yet, in his despair, he turned to God, asking the Lord to never abandon him. As the man surveyed his life, he realized how God had worked through the hardships he had suffered and through the difficult circumstances of his life. And he wanted to tell the next generation how amazing God truly is. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you have done such wonderful things. Let me proclaim your power to the new generation. Amen. Amen. Susan? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's lesson, and the date of the lesson is May 17th, Year of the Lord, 2020. We are still in the spring quarter of our lesson books, and we have been studying Justice and the Prophets. And today is lesson number 12, titled Practice Justice. Thank you. The scripture reading for today comes from Jeremiah 21. I will be reading Jeremiah 21, 8 through 14, the King James Version. And unto, unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence, but he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans, or surrenders to the Babylonians, that besiege you, he shall live. And his life shall be unto him for a prey. For I have set my face against this city for evil, and not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like fire and burn that none can quench because of the evil of your doings. Behold, I am against thee, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, who shall come down against us, or who shall enter into our habitations? But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. Before we get into the lesson based on those verses, let's talk a little bit about Jeremiah. Who was he? 
Jeremiah happens to be the second of the four major prophets. That includes Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. He wrote the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations. And these type of books happen to be major prophecy. Jeremiah happened to be the son of a priest from a small town in Judah. He was near, nearing only 20 years old when he began to, prophes to prophesy, and he continued for the rest of his adult life, perhaps more than 40 additional years. Like Isaiah, his message and loud cries from God were not heeded by the people. In fact, it is believed that he was stoned to death by these people after the great exile to Babylon. Jeremiah was not part of the Babylonian exile. It's believed he was taken to Egypt to avoid being sent to Babylon, and it was Egypt that exasperated countrymen who had also fled from Judah eventually stoned him. Jeremiah was known as the lamenting prophet because God was very angry during the time he prophesied. And true prophetic news from God was rarely good. However, the prophet also offers some of the most beautiful words of hope in the Bible. It is thought that the book of Jeremiah may have been completed in Egypt. Jeremiah also had the unusual situation of prophesying for many years about the same impending disasters and then living long enough to see them come to pass. Jeremiah happens to be the 24th book of the Old Testament, and it was written between 585 and 570 BC. And the prophecies come true that are mentioned in the book during the time period of 575 BC to 25 AD. A couple of other things to note, there are no stories in Jeremiah, only prophecies. And there are two famous verses that come from the book, and they include, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is Jeremiah 29, 11. And the other verse is, Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And that is Jeremiah 33, 3. As we delve into this lesson, Jeremiah was prophesying to a nation behaving terribly, and judgment from God was on its way. The kingdom of Judah had watched as the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians. They feared the Babylonians, who would eventually overpower them and take them away into exile. But rather than risk God for help in repenting, they continued to hurt others and themselves. Jeremiah also makes great references to the new covenant God intended to have once Christ came to earth. This new covenant, covenant would be the means with which we could restore his relationship with mankind. Jeremiah wrote that God would write his law in our hearts and we would worship God directly and not through priests. Turning to the lesson, the prophet Jeremiah's ministry was to a people, the Judeans, and they had disobeyed the Lord. As a result, serious consequences loomed. God had sent prophet after prophet to warn both kings and commoners of pending destruction, but they did not listen. They acted as though they had God's favor no matter what. The Northern Kingdom, Israel, had been taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC. A century later, the survival of the Southern Kingdom of Judah was by no means assured. The Assyrians were still the dominant military and political power in the ancient Near East. The King of Assyria had died in 627 BC and his death laid bare the serious internal weaknesses in Assyria. Disorder and revolt erupted in every part of that empire. 
The consequences of Assyria's decline were felt in Judah. The Babylonians had stepped into the power vacuum left by the collapse of, the, of Assyria under the Babylonian king. Babylon came to, not, to dominate much of the Assyria's old territory. In the first chapter of Jeremiah, it places the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry at around 626 BC, and the book of Jeremiah preserves a prophecy in that ministry that took over the course of several decades through the reigns of five Judean kings and a governor. So putting into context, what had happened is Judah's final king had sent two representatives to Jeremiah in order to enlist Jeremiah's help to ensure God's aids aid against the king. So they were fighting against Babylon and they wanted to go to Jeremiah to seek God's favor. These messengers had some confidence in God's willingness to help them based on past work on Judah's behalf. But as Jeremiah's response shows, the request demonstrated a fundamental misunderstanding of Judah's standing with God. Jeremiah's response came in three parts. First came words against the king himself. Jerusalem's weapons will become a liability as the Lord himself fights against the city. The second of Jeremiah's three-part response turns his attention from the king to the people in general. God sets before them a stark choice between life and death. Similar expressions are common throughout the scriptures, but this one seems to recall the words of Moses, which said, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Jeremiah's words of judgment and doom come in the context of God's covenant with the people. The Lord still requires obedience and loyalty. The refusal to render to him their exclusive worship have brought them to this dire point. The choice presented to God's people in the days of Jeremiah is also presented to us collectively and individually, even today. Jesus speaks of the choice between life and death as a choice between a wide gate and a narrow way. Each of us is called to choose whatever path we take. Many still choose death by trusting in their own wisdom. Only following Jesus leads to life. The choice that Jeremiah had just presented in the previous work now paints in real life terms to stay in Jerusalem and try to hold against the Babylonians will mean certain death. Leaving the confines of the city and surrendering to the Babylonians is the only path to continued life. This is not the advice that the people had hoped for. They want to stay in this city and be delivered by God. However, the ways of life and death that Jeremiah presents are the only options. God has decided to punish his people. There will be no deliverance from the Babylonians. If they surrender to them, the Babylonians, the people will be rewarded with their lives and nothing more. Jeremiah's address to the people closes with a sobering restatement of the truth as God has determined. Translated, it means God has set his face against the people. He will do this to the city and it will be harm and not good. God's harm is not intended only as retribution. It is also intended to correct wayward children. We should understand that sometimes multiple layers are the nature of God's wrath. God's wrath, its punishment, simply because the one who receives it deserves it. All of this is a reminder of the absolute sovereignty of God. God cannot be manip manipulated. The destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the king of Babylon will happen because God has determined that it should. The focus of Jeremiah's message shifts again as he begins the third of his three 
sections. And in speaking to the royal house of Judah, the reference seems to be to all the members of the royal court, those who live in the palace and assist in carrying out the affairs of the state. They are not exempt from the indictment against the king and the commoner. In two words, Jeremiah sets forth God's vision. Those two words are administer justice. The justice spoken here can be understood in a legal sense. That includes adhering to the laws of Moses with regard to how people are to be treated, especially those who are most vulnerable. All of this certainly includes the royals and officials of the House of David, and such people seek to take what is not theirs. If human judges refuse to end this injustice, God's wrath will. The Lord addresses Jerusalem by way of its geographical characteristics. Both the valley and the rocky plateau make the inhabitants feel secure in the face of military advances. Jerusalem is bounded on three sides by deep valleys. Thus the city itself sits above its potential enemies on a defensive stronghold. The people of the city are overconfident in this situation. And as verse 14 tells us, I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forest and will consume everything around you. In conclusion, this lesson brings us to one of the most somber moments in the history of God's dealings with his covenant people. Jerusalem was beyond the point of repentance. The people's trust in their own wisdom meant death. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. May we, unlike the people of Jeremiah's day, repent while there is time. Shall we pray? Father, remind us daily that it's either the narrow way of life or the wide gate of destruction. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bill, do you want to leave us laughing? Probably. <laughs> Get up. <laughs> this, of course, is probably not so far off, especially with the corona lockdown and the cams having increased definition tied to the internet, drones, and all that sort of thing. This is a call of someone wanting to order something to eat. Caller, is this Gordon's Pizza? Google. No, this is Google's Pizza. Caller, I must have dialed the wrong number. Sorry. Google. No, sir. Google bought Gordon's Pizza last month. Caller. <coughs> Okay, I would like to order a pizza. Google, do you want your usual, sir? Caller, my usual? You know me? Google said, according to our caller ID data sheet, the last 12 times you called, you ordered an extra large pizza with three cheeses, sausage, pepperoni, mushrooms, and meatballs on a thick crust. Caller, okay, that's what I want. Google, may I suggest that this time you order a pizza with ricotta, a regular sun-dried tomatoes, and olives on a whole wheat, gluten-free, thin crust. Caller, what? I detest vegetables. Google, your cholesterol is not good, sir. <laughs> How the heck do you know that? Google, well, we cross-reference your home phone number with your medical records. We have the result of your blood test for the last seven years. Caller. Okay, but I do not want your rotten vegetable pizza. I already take medication for my cholesterol. Google, excuse me, sir, but you have not taken your medication regularly. <laughs> According to our database, you purchase a box of 30 cholesterol tablets once at Drug RX Network four months ago. Caller, I bought more from the drugstore. Google. It doesn't show on your credit card statement. <laughs> Caller, I paid cash. Google, but you did not withdraw enough cash according to your bank statement. <laughs> Caller, I have other sources of cash. 
Google. That doesn't show on your last tax return unless you brought them using an undeclared income source, which is against the law. Call her. What the heck? Google. So I'm sorry, sir. We use such information only with the sole intention of helping you. Call her. Enough already. I'm sick of death of Google, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and all the others. I'm going to an island without internet, cable TV, where there's no cell phone service and no one to watch me or spy on me. Google. I understand, sir, but you need to renew your passport first. It expired six weeks ago. <laughs> Shall we all be dismissed? <laughs> Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. The oh Lord, Lord, my strength, strength and, my and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I think we're going to do a couple more songs. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you still have your sheets here, um, an oldie but a goodie. Um, and I, you know, this song is not about uh, looking to heaven and not being concerned about today. What I love about I fly, I'll Fly Away is you have a real confidence in where you're going so you can really live well today. And um, it's not escapist. It's uh, really uh, when we have confidence and hope in the future where we're going, I think we can really be alive in the moment, right? Anyway, that's my little take on that song. In the meantime... Something when this life is over, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I Turn your page over. Um, I stand amazed. I love um, how marvelous. Let's sing this together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Sin and my sorrow and 
sing How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be You sang over the train. Yeah. That's pretty strong. He only does four. Yeah. Four horns. Do you ever hear the train going by here, Pat? Yeah. Yeah. Every, Sunday, every Saturday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Do you even hear the train anymore? Is the real question. Not in the house. Don't even hear it. I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um. And again, I love this hymn, it is well, just because the context in which it was written, right? Just um, uh, Horatio having experienced just utter loss with his family. So it comes from this place where he's like, hey, even in when things are really bad and challenging, um, God is still faithful. God is still good. He uh, is sovereign and still loves us. So. As we do this, I just hope that we enjoy that, um, that goodness and that faithfulness. And it's an interesting time, isn't it? When everything's sort of turned upside down. God is still God. God is still good. God's still, like in Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you. And he knows them and he wants us to enjoy them. And it was fun to, uh, we had our senior uh, celebration for seniors. Look out. And it was fun to speak that verse over these high school seniors as they look at the next season of their life. And I thought, you know, it's good for every season of life that we just press into God's plans, right? 2911, maybe a life verse for us. When peace like a river I my way When sorrows like Well, it is. 
Department. Uh, does it all. I know. A videographer, <laughs> producer. <laughs> does it all. Is that it? Thank you. Glad to be here. It's great to be together. Literally see each other. I, I, it's funny, I was people were waving as they drove by. I was like, hey. Was just <laughs> singing. So, saw some friends, saw some people I didn't know. <laughs> I should have yelled, stop. Come join us. <laughs> 